Hi everyone, good evening, and welcome to this webinar, Bridging AI Innovation and Compliance. I think we can wait another two minutes so everyone can connect, but I want to say welcome to Kevin and Sandro. So um, I'm Laura Ferrari, the Digital Marketing Manager at Modulus and your host for today. And uh, again, so I'm happy to introduce our speakers for today's webinar, Sandro Saita and Kevin Chavinsky. So Sandro Saita is passionate about helping companies to become even more data-driven. He has worked in various industries to foster usage of data. But right now, he's the founder and CEO of Fiatata. Sandro is also a lecturer in different schools in Lausanne, for example, the Business School Lausanne. And at the same time, he's also a member of the executive committee of the Competence Center Corporate Data Quality, an association that supports the role of chief data officer in Europe. Instead, the second speaker, Kevin Chavinsky, he is the co-founder and CEO of Modulus, and he's currently driving the mission to develop and operate AI products and services in a new regulated environment. So he's deeply engaged in crafting and championing responsible and trustworthy AI solution, which means that his dedication is not just to the technical brilliance of AI, but also equally to its ethical and responsible deployment. So, of course, that was a very short introduction. I know that you have a long work experience. So if I miss some important information, please feel free to, to add some information. Um, but I just wanted to say that at the end of this webinar, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have some questions, please write the questions on the chat. And then at the end, I will read the questions for you. And... I think that I say everything. So Kevin and Sandra, the stage is yours. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. I'm just going to add the fact that um, the executive uh, committee I'm part of is CDO IQ Europe, which is an event we organize for chief data officers. And so very happy to be here um, tonight with you. And I have um, quite a few questions because I'm very interested also, like I guess most of you, about these um, topics of um, AI regulation and innovation. And so I will start asking you um, a few questions, Kevin, and happy to discuss that uh, with you. So maybe the first one is, about, um, you know, in the last few years, we've seen a lot of regulations um, put in place or coming, GDPR, of course, uh, the EU AI Act, and also in Switzerland, the new federal act on data protection. And my first question is a little bit, um, why all this regulation and, and why now? So uh, thank you, Laura, for the great introduction. And, and thank you, Sandra, for, for joining us uh, here today. Um, I, I think fundamentally the reason why these regulations come about is because um, people, citizens, um, want them. They have concerns about technology. They want to see the the use of their personal data, the use of AI uh, regulated. So things like the GDPR and the Swiss Data Protection Law, they came about because people saw what happens to their personal data on the internet, how it's bartered, sold, and used to, to, to sell them products. Um, the case of AI regulation came, I think, very clearly to the forefront after the meteoric launch of ChatGPT, which uh, wasn't just a breakthrough in AI technology, but also uh, as, as an AI application that everybody could use and interact with and could see the impact it was going to have on people's lives. So, of course, uh, people asked, well, how is this technology regulated um, and 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 uh, what can you and what can't you do with it? Um Sandra, how do you how do you see this situation? Yes, I think it's it's a very interesting uh, point, and I see that basically it's coming um, to companies. Uh, I, I see it as uh, also uh, clear challenges for depending on where the company is at which level. Um, so, for example, there are the companies that, which are very advanced, and for these companies, it's going to be maybe more easy to follow this regulation and and uh, you know keep up with the the pace of this regulation coming. But at the same time, I see also a lot of companies that are just starting to use data science and AI, and I guess for them, it's going to be 
maybe harder or they need to go fast to catch up also with what they need to uh, to put in place um, around this to be able to uh, to also play in the game and, and be able to use AI and be competitive with other companies. And, and maybe what's... Yes? Yeah. No, go ahead. No, no, I was I was going to ask another question, but if you want to compliment on, on that one. Yeah, I, I think there's there's also um, an economic and competitive aspect to it because um, if you set the rules in an, in an industry that's global, you have enormous influence. And so uh, particularly those companies are worried about regulation and, and the burden of trying to, uh, to uh, comply with them. You, you can also see them as a, as a form of, of advantage of edge. So the sooner you comply and the sooner you can tell your, your partners, your customers, hey, if you send me your data, it's going to be secure. I'm going to uh, handle it in a, in a reliable way. And the same with AI. Hey, if you if you use our AI based product or service, um, you can trust us because we built it based on responsible principles. It's actually a competitive advantage versus those that reject the regulation, delay implementation, and 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 don't engage in, in it in that spirit. Yes, and 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 maybe one question further on that part. I mean, do you think it's 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 fair for the different companies? Because obviously, if I'm a you know tech giant, it's going to be easy, and even some of them are pushing for this regulation to come. But if I'm an SME, um, you know, it's going to be much harder for me to uh, you know to to go with this regulation because I cannot dedicate a full team, you know, of people, um, you know, working on on being able to uh, you know to uh, to comply with this regulation. So, what's what's your thought about that? So, I mean, you're you're actually the expert on on advising companies on. Uh, data and and AI initiatives and and you know how much work it can be just to set up the infrastructure and the 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 policies and the team before you get the first value creation from from a product or service that that you can deploy. Um, yes, these these new regulations requirements make make it harder, make make uh, uh, require more effort, more time, more resources spent. But uh, uh, again, I would say the counterpoint to that is um, the element of trust. But also the element of reliability, and so if I uh, make a uh, an analogy to a product that we're more familiar with within the physical world, uh, if you manufacture a car, and suddenly the government comes along and says, "Ah, but here are now these new safety requirements," that's going to make the car more expensive. It's going to make it harder to to innovate and to develop. On the other hand, as a consumer, if I'm looking for a car, I don't want to have to research in depth whether the car is going to protect me in a crash. I want to know that the government required a, a well-working seat belt, an airbag, uh, the compression zones, or, or, or whatever it takes to, to keep me safe. Um, and that uh, lowers my barrier, my, my willingness to, to go purchase such a product. And I think the same thing, again, it's going to be true of AI. Yes. Thank you. And another question now is maybe a lot of discussion are going around this you know, AI act in Europe. Um, uh, can you you know explain just in essence what is what is the act about and and uh, you know why should you know companies um, start thinking about you know uh, this act and and what they need to do to comply with it? Yeah, so the the EU has been working on this thing called the AI Act for for many years now, and when when they conceived of it, they made some fundamental decisions on how they should view AI, and and they made some interesting choices, and they're interesting because they're consequential because now everyone else around the world is designing their AI laws, their AI regulations along similar lines. So what do I mean by that? Um, the AI, um, the EU chose to start with a risk-based approach. So rather than regulating the technology itself, they said, what matters is what you use it for. So if you use it to, to filter your, your spam folder, um, that's a lot less risky and has a lot less impact than if you use AI to decide whether somebody should uh, get a mortgage or not, or should be hired for a job. And so while the, the AI system behind them might be similarly complex, um, the impact of a mistake or a bias in the latter case, of course, is much more consequential. So they decided to take an approach that's risk-based. So what do you use it for? It's proportional to that. Um, the EU also took the step of saying there are certain practices, certain applications that we're going to ban outright. And the the, the big example of that is uh, social scoring, as is practiced in China. The EU said that no AI system of this kind should be allowed to, to operate. Um, 
Another really interesting uh, approach they took is very much a product safety approach. So go back what I said about the cars. Um, actually, a lot of the, the inspiration and the mechanisms in, in the AI Act are inspired actually by, by the medical device regulation. So uh, as you build an x-ray machine or, or a surgery um, instrument, um, you have to go through certain quality assurance steps. You have to go through a risk management steps. And they said, if you're building a risky AI system, you have to do a, a, go through similar steps. Yeah. And and out of these, I don't know, if I put myself in the shoes of a companies who would say, no, I'm using AI, there is this act coming, but maybe there are some stuff that are subject to interpretation, right? In a sense, well, you know, I think this is risky. I think this is not. And maybe the person who will, you know, audit um, these systems will think differently. So maybe some of the things it's clear, right? If it's really like, you know, uh, patient data for a hospital, you think, okay, that's clear. Um, but, you know, there, I guess there are all these fuzzy situation happening. And how do you think is this really, you know, possible to enforce and to audit, you know, how companies comply or not with such an act? Because it's it seems to me a little bit... Uh, interpretable in a sense, right? I mean, I completely agree. And 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 you probably have some real examples out of out of practice where, you know, uh, those edge cases might, might be quite hard to decide. And of course, that's also the challenge that the EU faces. Um, they have to make a list of, of use cases that they consider high risk, still subject to negotiation. But some things in there are very clear, like um, uh, anything to do with hiring or promotion of employees. I think we can all agree that's relatively well delineated. But there are other things in there, and again, to be confirmed uh, in the final negotiations, one of the items that's considered a high risk is called critical digital infrastructure. And so even uh, you and I, if we're going to talk about which parts of uh, digital infrastructure are critical, we're going to come to, to a different uh, um, decision, right? And that's going to be really hard uh, to navigate. And um, yeah, some fundamental choices will have to be made by real world practitioners as they decide, is this a use case we really want to do? Is this use case potentially high risk? How many use cases do we already have that might be high risk that either we're only barely uh, aware that are somewhere deep in our infrastructure? I mean, these are questions that um, CDOs and, and data leaders should be thinking about now, because if the answer is, yeah, actually this use case might be high risk, we're not sure yet. You're going to have only two years, and of course, in a big organization, two years is not a long time to uh, to rebuild that use case and get it ready for certification. Yes, and so it's it's a good point. And coming back to, you know, the role of of CDO, chief data officers, and and chief analytics officers, and so on. Um, I mean, what what will be the recommendations? Because they could think, you know, maybe I already started doing something for GDPR, and now I need to do that. So, I mean, do they need to, uh, you know, have different um, templates or frameworks, or you know, what what will be kind of, you know, some tips or recommendation? You will say, okay, if I have to start with that now, I'm appointed as a new CDO, and I'm discussing with with with, with some of them that just started a new role of CDO um, in in a company, and they they will ask themselves, okay, you know, should I, you know, be the team for that? Should I hire someone? Should I do it myself? And you know, wh where to start, kind of. I I think there's quite a few things that that a new CDO or a CDO face with this challenge should look at. I think the first one is what I just mentioned. You you need to build an inventory of what use cases you already have. Like most most organizations have many layers of systems and, and applications that 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 they run. So I think a, a really good inventory of what's already there is going to be essential. I think another thing that's really important is because. Um, AI machine learning is now a much more regulated activity is to be in close contact with and collaboration with functions in the business that that maybe were less relevant before. Those are legal risk and compliance, right? Because now the the, the fines are significant enough that they are, are very serious for the business. And so having those other functions on board and um, in close collaboration is going to be really essential. Um, and then the third step, after um, you've identified <clears throat> your your task list, your to do list of applications that need that that need to be reviewed, rebuilt, or or replaced, um, you need to start building up the best practices, the 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 um, the controls and the, the checklists um, to build and monitor these applications, so that when it comes time to have them certified, right, to get a get a CE mark, do a conformity assessment, um, that you're ready for that. 
and that, that your team has the expertise to prepare and submit those, by the looks of it, very voluminous amounts of documentation that are going to have to be ready. I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can speak from, from your experience also a little bit about how um, these new types of challenges, how CDOs um, handle them. Yes, I think it's a, I don't know, it's a common question, at least I, I get um, discussing with them, um, you know, uh, about this regulation. And again, for me, it's really linked to where they are, because if they are at the very beginning, they may think as, okay, this is something we need to keep in mind, but it's too soon to, you know, concretely think about that. Or if they're really into it, and they have, as you said, already a list of use cases that are in development or even in production, then it's a complete different story. But what I feel is that it's, I don't know your opinion, but it's going to to have a kind of a two speed games, right? Again, the, the big ones, they're going to say, well, you know, we have enough engineers, uh, you know, data engineers, MLOps engineers, and so on to say, okay, this one, they are not conforming correctly. So we need to change them or even stop them, but that's fine. We're going to do other things. And maybe the smaller players or the smaller companies are going to say, well, you know, can we really kill that project? Because if we don't have the time or we don't have the people to do it, you know, we don't have like um, so many people from the legal team, we can make sure, you know, it's going to work with the regulation or whatsoever. You see my point? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if this is going to be even a, a way to separate further, you know, the, the big players from the smaller one, because it's going to be uh, not fair in a sense, because they, they don't have the same um, means and, and to, to, to achieve what they want to do with AI. I, I share your concern, and I think um, the best guide we have to what what might happen here is uh, what happened with GDPR, which um, of course had a huge impact on on on, on the data business. Um, of course, GDPR impacted uh, the the large global enterprises and, and small small uh, companies very differently. So obviously, the the big companies, the global companies, they have the resources and the teams and the expertise, as you say, to to adapt. And when challenged, fight back on the technical grounds or in the legal field. They can afford to do that. They can drag out a court case and wait and see what happens maybe a few years down the road. Um, a small SME gets uh, dinged by the data protection office in their country and, and they get a fine and, and that's it. Now, I think my reaction to, to your point is, is a little bit in that, which is um, the smaller companies probably will also... I hope get a more lenient treatment from the regulator where it's not escalating immediately to business ending fines, but essentially a, a feedback, hey, look, your, your application, there's some things that, that you need to improve here and, and there's some things missing here. Uh, we, we, we urge you to, to fix them and, and, and resubmit. Uh, my hope is that the, the bodies that are gonna be charged with um, enforcement and audits uh, are gonna behave in this way. Yes. And and then I have um, a question that is maybe more biased toward things that I do a lot, which is basically, you know, pushing for improved data literacy within companies. And I'm thinking about that because, I mean, if you think about it, if you want, uh, you know, the legal team and other people in the company to uh, comply with this regulation, I guess uh, people need to understand what is AI, how it works and so on. So uh, I don't know, I would think this is even, you know, an yet another reason for going further with, you know, um, data literacy within companies, uh, again, at the employee level, at the top level of companies, but also for, uh, you know, legal staff and so on, so that they really understand, I mean, um, because I, I, don't, I don't think what I discussed with, with some of them today is I don't think they all really understand, you know, how is the machine learning model built and how that works and so on. And mm -hmm. so I think they need, they don't need to become data scientists, obviously, but I guess they need to have some you know, data literacy level so that they know, okay, what is AI, you know, how does it work? What are the limits? What are the application and so on? I guess this needs to come also maybe hand in hand with with this regulation, right? We completely agree because the uh, the the legal risk compliance people that, that now have to be involved in this process, um, they need to be able to have that conversation with their counterparts in, in data engineering and, and, and technical functions. And, and it culminates actually in, in the types of discussions that then the company leadership will have to have that I don't think have taken place too many times yet, except in very special circumstances. Like there's going to be a, a discussion that has technical, legal, business, and, and ethical uh, components to it. Like how many points in profit margin are we willing to give up uh, for how many points of improvement on, on a fairness score for machine learning model, right? These are choices that are coming to these companies and the people making them, yeah, they they need to they need that education and that knowledge of 
uh, data, machine learning, statistics, in order to even have the discussion. I'm not even talking about being able to make a good decision here because that's really, really difficult. Yes. Yeah, I think there's there's going to be interesting discussion also, as you said, between the legal people and 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 the data teams, um, because they don't speak the same language, and it's going to be very interesting also to think about you know what is what is needed. If you think about I don't know being discriminative or not, I think there are some fields you know you will ask a data scientist you know um, you should not use discriminative feature. They will say okay maybe you know age is clear, gender is clear, and so on. But then I guess there's going to be all this discussion where um, you know. The question is, what are the features you're using that could be discriminative? And mm -hmm. then the data scientist could say, I don't know, I'm, I'm taking that side again. I could say, well, I'm doing a model to discriminate, you know, the cases which have frauds and the, the one which don't have fraud. So all my features are trying to be discriminative in a sense, right? You're trying to separate two classes. So that's going to be an interesting discussion to see in the end. Okay, what is really, you know, discriminative, you know, and what is at risk or what is not in, in the end? And, and and I don't think that this, that precisely is, uh, the type of problem you just outlined that that there are clear guidelines either in the law or in the, the draft um, industry standards. Um, it's only just a developing field, and I think it's going to be important for the people who are knowledgeable on the subject to to stand up now and start the discussion on on how those kinds of questions should be resolved and and uh, what me what what measures what metrics should be used in these cases to have this discussion in a way so that not everyone also has to reinvent the wheel because these are hard discussions. They take take time, they take effort, they take energy. Um, yeah, and we will have to start to converge maybe in the next two, three, four years as these practices become more common, the obligations become law, um, that the, the types of solutions for these scenarios become a little bit standardized and easier to understand. And... Uh, maybe also a question, I think, or a topic that is interesting to to discuss. Coming back to the idea of innovation and compliance, is it? I mean, is it one in opposition to the other? So you know, I'm thinking if I'm a company and there is some interpretation in this regulation, obviously, as we discussed, uh, will I need to make a choice between you know trying to be more innovative and maybe more at risk, you know, with uh, being compliant or not? Or the other way around, I could say, well, I'm going to be, you know, taking much less risk and I, in the, you know, the worst case, or let's say in the extreme case, I don't do any AI, right? So I'm mm -hmm. just trying to think if, uh, you know, companies in the end will need to, you know, put the cursor somewhere to say, okay, I do more and I take more risk, or I do less and I do, and I take less risk. I mean, do you see that as a kind of, a, um, you know, a balance between innovation and compliance in the end or not? I don't know. No, I, I think it is a bias, uh, a balance, and I think it is already starting to be discussed. And there are going to be companies that are going to say, we're going to do the absolute minimum to comply here. And the other companies that say, we, we take these things very, very seriously. We want to be um, as ethical, as responsible as we can be and actually go promote ourselves as that. And and uh, to go back to your experience, especially in the, in the data privacy era, I'm sure there are an analogs, and you can tell us about that, where some companies do the absolute minimum, and then other companies take data protection very, very seriously. Yes. And, and so question or interesting would be to see if this balance is also kind of company or even industry specific, you know, maybe we'll see some industries that will be much less risky, I guess, you know, like the health sectors and so on, maybe they will take much less risk um, to be more compliant. And and because the data is also more uh, sensitive, um, whereas maybe other industries, I don't know, like e-commerce and so on, will maybe take more risk. I guess no, that's absolutely. also what you're Absolutely. And this will also inform some technology choices. And it goes back to um, sort of advising companies on, on AI strategies, right? Everybody wants to use uh, uh, LLMs to build their own chatbot, their own own chat GPT. And if we've learned anything over the last year is that these these uh, LLM based systems are anything but secure. And and every day people post a new type of a hijacking, prompt hijacking, or exploit to get these models to do something that they weren't intended to, or to reveal private data, or or, or do something that goes totally against uh, the in, the original intentions. So. Absolutely. Um, these uh, considerations will have to be made, yeah. And maybe one question is, you know, every time, and, and I also discuss that with companies, you know, when you bring data and AI, innovation within companies, then there is obviously associated change because you're, you know, you're proposing a new way of solving a problem with, with data and AI. So now this regulation, they need to be, uh, you know, enforced and put in place within, within companies. So it's also going to bring change. Um, 
it's very hard, I guess, for companies to to see, you know, how long it's going to take because it's it's not like you have plenty of examples of companies that already, you know, are fully compliant with these new regulations. And so um how much time do the companies have to, you know, uh, to, to be aligned with this? And how do you think that, you know, the change management will will uh, will take time within these companies? So I, I think it's going to take a long time to get ready because there's a change management component to it. And there's just a pure technology development component to it. Um, the AI Act itself sees a transition period of two years, say, same as for GDPR. Two years to to make these kinds of changes is tough for large organizations. It's even tough for, for startups and small organizations, but it's, it's maybe a little bit more manageable. Um, but of course, the AX is not the only uh, game in town. We just had the executive order from President Biden, which is directing uh, the U.S. Um, agencies to, to start looking at uh, AI, misuse of AI, discriminatory AI. Right now, actually, the EEOC in the U.S., has already settled the first case uh, specifically for uh, age discrimination in hiring using using AI. So um, there isn't some sort of long lead time now to get ready here. Um, particularly if you're large, you have to get started actually yesterday. Um, and there are actually some companies out there that have taken this problem seriously. They saw the horizon and they started years ago to get ready for this moment. And they're going to have the edge. Yeah. And... Maybe a, f- a further point also concerning that is about, you know, I guess, who will then, you know, take the responsibility of, of you know, uh, conforming to this um, new regulation within companies. And I'm talking maybe here more about, you know, medium to large companies where you really have these different roles. And I, and I think it's going to be interesting, right? Because today they may have a chief data officer and even this role is going to, uh, I feel, split further. We, we see sometimes a given company can have a chief data officer more on the defense side and then a chief AI officer more on the offense side. So do you think there will be also some roles that will focus even more on just, you know, kind of following the regulation around AI or, you know, a chief trustworthy AI officer and so on? Are this coming? I, I, because for, for big companies, I mean, it may make sense. It's absolutely possible, and I think new job titles will will be created here, and and I think it remains to be seen what what the optimal splits here are. I think nobody knows. Um, I want to propose actually a job title for you to see if if it makes sense. Um, basically, the chief AI legal officer. So this would be a person that is has both legal training, um, but also um, is uh, is is deeply knowledgeable about AI, knows how to train models, knows how to deal with data, so that they can serve as a bridge between the sort of traditional legal and and compliance side on on the one side, and and the engineering side on on the other. Do do you think this kind of role can exist? I think it will be very valuable. Uh, again, t- the question will be which companies can afford such kind of position, but. Already how I see the role of CDO um, splitting into these different roles, I think it's very good because a lot of CDOs also in the past were really focusing toward the defense side or the governance management data quality. And now uh, we see also these new roles more on the analytics and AI side. So I do see a split indeed into security, into you know AI regulation and so on. So I would see that as, as making sense because it's it's not, a, let's say, one you know single person uh, job to, to take care of, of all of this. Mm-hmm. And by the way, we could at some point also uh, see the the title of chief um, generative AI officer, right, coming. But that's another topic. In, in, indeed, and 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 who knows if next year uh, generative AI is is actually still actual because we we don't know what's coming next because the pace of innovation right now is so fast. It's actually one of the challenges, right? Like, how do we keep these regulations up to date? Um, if the engineers and the scientists keep coming up with completely new technology every couple of months. Yes. Very interesting. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you, but we have a question on the chat. So if it's okay for you, we can move on to the Q&A. Um, so yeah, actually it's a question off topic, but the question is your views on what happened in OpenAI and more specifically the unconfirmed news that they have achieved, EGI. So basically, the question is more on, on what's happening these days with OpenAI, right? Yeah, exactly. And Sam Altman, okay. Well, I mean, I, I I don't know much more than what everybody knows, but I think it's it's very interesting 
points to see that indeed, and some articles uh, were discussing that it's it's a uh, it's a big challenge for companies because now they are building a lot of system based on some technologies, and that you see that in the end it's maybe very fragile because it's depending on a few people out there. Um, so it's coming a lot into discussion, I guess, as well. And it's uh, I think also the case for Switzerland about the ownership of you know some of these systems, so that you we are not relying too much on the us so i think it's a uh, it's good in a sense that it's happening because i think it's waking up uh, people a little bit and companies on the fragility mm -hmm. and and the risk associated to uh, to such technologies that are based on on uh, on some companies that uh, that of course behind i mean you have the tech giants but still it's um, yeah it's very volatile in a sense to me, the whole open AI situation reminded me strongly of uh, the movie Rashomon, which is this old Japanese movie about a murder. Uh, and, and the movie is just the story of the different participants of the murder uh, in front of the court. And they all tell their story. And all the stories are interesting and plausible. Um, but at the end of the movie, there's no resolution because there's no way to tell what really happened. And, and it's a bit like that with open AI. Like we have all these different stories that have come out that I think will continue to come out of what really happened. And I mean, to be honest, I, I don't know how to piece it together uh, in, into, into a real coherent story that, 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 that I can believe. I mean, maybe that down the years will, will become clearer, but it remains to be seen. The question about um, AGI it, it goes in a similar direction because of course, um, making claims that you have discovered or developed something that looks like AGI is, of course, a very serious claim, but it's also part of marketing, right? You you want to keep uh, the attention on you and your product and 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 the valuation of your 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 company. So the claim that you've discovered the most important thing in in human history, of course, um, is a very serious one and should be taken with appropriate skepticism. Yeah. Let's see if we have another question. No, I don't see any question. So, Sandro, Kevin, do you want to add something more? Well, it was a real pleasure to talk with you, Sandro, and get your perspective on the the practitioner side, and 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 I enjoyed our discussion. And thank you, Kevin. It was very good, and I think very interesting for data leaders and CDOs alike also to um, to learn a bit more about this regulation and and associated challenges and and what needs to be done to to comply with this. I just want to say something. So we know that AI regulation, AI in general, is a complex topic. And actually, the mission of Modulus is also to inform and to educate uh, all the audience that we have here in LinkedIn. That's why we are organizing different events. And again, thank you, Sandra, to participate to this webinar. And But yeah, next week, we will have another webinar. And I will share again the screen. And the webinar will be, uh, so the focus of the webinar will be the UA Act. Uh, actually, the title is The Global Impact of the UA Act, a Brussels Side Effect. The speakers will be Kevin again and Marco Almada as researcher of the European University Institute. And the webinar will be on Tuesday, November 28th. Uh, 5 p.m. so same time so I really suggest you to to register and that's it so thank you so much thank you to all the participants thanks again Kevin and Sandro and if you want to be in touch with Kevin and